Hi, I'm Lee Johnson, and I, today I want to talk about working with powers and spirits, um, but specifically when there are young children in the house, because this can be very important for parents. So let's get into that. Okay, so, I've spoken about working with powers and spirits, um, gods, goddesses, um, nature spirits, uh, elemental spirits and elemental kings, um, and even uh, demons. I've um, spoken about them quite a bit in the past, and uh, a couple videos back I did, I more spoke about uh, invocation, evocation techniques. Um, and it was raised on that video in the comments um, about what to do if there are children around um, because generally I don't work with a protective circle um, but when there are young children around there are certain things that need to be taken into consideration now mine's all grown up, she's 22 now um, I, did, I was trying to get her into this video to actually speak about this but uh, she's a bit shy on, on camera so um, I thought I was shy, but she's even worse. Um, so I'm just going to relay what happened to us in the past. Uh, it's nothing bad, nothing terrible. Um, but it is something that parents need to take into consideration. And it's not necessarily because what you are working with, you know, the, the powers and the spirits that you're working with um, are necessarily bad or they're going to cause harm or something like that. Um, but I did find that at one stage, um, some years back, I was working with Papa Legba, and while I was calling him, um, he actually stopped by in my daughter's room just to check on her, and then he came to me. Um, but she was in her early teens at the time, if I remember correctly, um, but it did freak her out a bit because she saw this old man standing next to her bed. Um, so you can imagine, you know, you, you, your child has no idea what's going on and all of a sudden this, this person standing next to their bed smiles at them and walks out again. Um, she, she, I mean, she, she know, knew by that stage what I was into and what I was doing. Um, so she came to me afterwards and said, what was that? And I explained to her and she was fine with it. She, didn't, she actually didn't feel threatened or anything. Um, she actually felt like he was there to actually just comfort her and just protect her actually but the fact that this person this spirit was just standing next to a bed all of a sudden it can get a bit freaky for children it can get a bit freaky for adults um, but yeah for children it can be a bit more disturbing um, so you want to try and you know limit those interactions um, and just ease them in as they grow up um, now if you are doing any kind of ritual and you are calling on, on powers and spirits um, and you are using a protective circle, that's great. Um, but I, I was thinking about this, there's actually something missing in this whole scenario. Because whether you're in a room that is dedicated as a temple room and that room is protected and while you're in that room there are no astral entities, astral, astral pests, or any, anything, anything negative, any kind of negative energy, or, you know, just general astral leeches um, that can attach themselves to us, um, or spirits, entities, whatever you don't want into the circle, um, you just want to specifically work with the entities, the powers, the spirits that you want to work with at that particular time, so you keep everything out. Uh, or everything else out and you, you pull in what you what you want to work with. But whether that's done in a, in a room specifically designed for working, a temple room or a working room, or whether you uh, move furniture aside and you make a temporary space um, for workings, at spe workings specifically. Um, if you are setting up a protective circle, that's great, that keeps everything out of your space. But your children are not in that space unless you are extending it outside the actual house. Um, 
So when you're working in that space, that's great. You're keeping all the entities, the astral parasites and everything out, but they are still, you know, coming to you. And because you're working magic, it's a bit of a sort of a moth to a flame type scenario where all these astral pests and parasites start wanting to get in because they see this light and, you know, that's where they're, what they're attracted to. So in, that, in, this, in this scenario, you may be protecting the space and you feel like you're protecting the, or keeping the, the, your, your children out of harm's way because you, you're working in a, in a protective circle. Um, but they are outside the circle as well as all the astral entities. So there's a bit more, I feel there's a bit more that needs to actually be said and a bit more that needs to actually be done in this case. So my suggestion would be to set up warding. Um, and there are actually two things I want to talk about. There's a lot of ways you can actually go about protecting spaces and protecting people, not just yourself, but other people like your children, maybe even your spouse, uh, your boyfriend, girlfriend, you know, people that you want to keep protected from whatever entities could be attracted to your space as you're working. Um, and one is to do just general warding. And two is to actually um, uh, employ the help of a house ghost. Um, the house ghost or the house spirit I'm going to be getting into in more depth next month because uh, I'll be talking a lot about traditional craft next month. So, but I'll just give you a general idea of, of stuff now. So with the warding, um, I did do a video some time back about protection and warding, and in that video is a little ritual um, that is excellent for calling a ward. And that ward, first of all, anybody coming into magic to start with, needs to ward themselves. Um, that ward is always around, but we need to become aware of it. We need to actually interact with it. And so the first, one of the first things you should do when you start on a magical path is actually do a warding ritual, some kind of warding where you are actually calling your ward to you. You are getting to know it. You are interacting with it. You are finding out what its name is, etc., etc., etc. Um, so that little ritual itself it's an easy ritual it's it's very simple you might not be aware of your ward um on the first go it might take a, a few sessions so that's okay don't worry about that the fact is the ward's always there but when you interact with it and you become um more in tune with it then the protection that it actually provides becomes a lot better so um have a look at, I'll, I'll link the video up top i'm never sure when I'm recording, if it's this corner or that corner. So I'm just going to point to both. There you go. In the corner, the link. So as I say, you, you know, you, you ward yourself. But what you can also do is ward the people in your life and your actual home, home your house, um, whatever, wherever you are, wherever you live. Um, even if it's a tent in the woods. If you live there, that's fine. Ward the tent. Ward the area. Um, so you can do that ritual for yourself, for your home, for your children, for your spouse, for your boyfriend, girlfriend, whoever. Uh, if your grandmother lives in the house, you can do it for her as well. Um, so have a look at that and give it a bash and try it. Uh, it's very effective and it's very easy, very simple. That's why I like it so much. It's just its simplicity. So what you can do when you actually do the warding, you know, if you're doing it with yourself, you're obviously going to build the columns and the walls, well, the room that you actually um, place yourself in and then call your ward in um, around yourself. But when you're doing it for someone else or for your home, your home's actually a bit easier because you can stand in the middle of your home and do the thing. And all you do is just project columns and walls and a ceiling and a floor um, around your home around the entire home. You can do it around your entire property if you want to. And then you call the ward in for the home itself. Now, it's going to, that's probably going to be different to what your ward is. Um, and as I said in that video, the ward that comes is often quite unexpected. You might be thinking of this huge big dragon that comes down and all of a sudden you have just a, a load of hummingbirds or something like that, you know. 
So you can do it around your home, but then if you want to do it for a person, um, I did this for my daughter when she was um, just a baby. She was a year or two old and she had flu or cold or something. And I did it for her and um, to protect her and heal her. So what you do is, all you do is you, you imagine, you just use visualization, imagination, um, and you imagine the person in front of you you build the space around them in front of you and then you call the ward for them not for you for them so you call their ward and you the ward will come in uh, it will introduce itself to you because you're you're the parent there's not going to be any kind of resistance or any kind of trouble um, you know trying to communicate with it uh, you are the parent you, know, you are it's, you are the child's guardian and therefore it will obviously accept you and it won't try and push you away or keep you away uh, in a protective manner. So you call the ward in, you talk to it, you find out what its name is, you, you ask it to protect your child um, from any harm, from anything, from any astral entities, from parasites, from negativity in general, whatever you want to protect it from. Um, but I mean the ward itself knows what to protect you or someone else someone else from so there's no problem there um, so that would be the one thing I would do um, there are a lot as I say there are a lot of other ways you can protect um, your home when I mean, you can put witch balls up um, you can use smudging to get rid of negativity um, you can you know you can paint the walls with salt in the paint um, you know, whatever you actually find suits you, there's a lot of ways you can protect an actual home. So, but what I'm trying to say is don't just protect the space that you're working in. Don't use a protective circle only. Protect the entire home. And it'll keep all that crap out. Um, now, the other one that I love, that I like to work with, is the house ghost or the house spirit. And this can often come in different forms and depending on the tradition that you're working with and uh, especially if you if you actually are part of a traditional family uh, with a traditional family what often happens is that the the protective elements and the protective spirits actually get passed on from generation to generation um, wasn't the case with me so I called my own house ghost um, as I say I'm going to get into this a lot more next month uh, but just generally, to, to actually call a house ghost is quite easy and you can actually get kids involved with this. Um, the house ghost in a lot of uh, areas in, in England and such is called a brownie. Um, it's, you know, all over the world it's got different names. Um, I just remember it being called brownie. And the brownie, there's a lot of stories and myths about the brownie. Um, they will protect your home and they will actually often clean up after you um, but I'd, I've had you know I haven't had one do the dishes yet unfortunately but uh, what I have found is that the the house ghost if you actually they, they do like a clean and tidy home so if you do not tidy up then you know that they, they start acting up um, you know one day you might go and need to go out and you're trying to find your car keys and you can't find them anywhere um, until you actually go and clean what you, the mess that you made. Um, and then you go back to the spot where you usually leave your car keys and they're there. Um, so they do get a bit antsy when you don't keep your place nice, neat and tidy. Uh, I think mine's getting a bit antsy at the moment. The kitchen's a bit of, in a bit of disarray. But uh, you know, I'll get that sorted out. Anyway, um, so with the house ghost... As I said, get, you can get the kids involved. It's fun. Um, the house ghost is fun. They, they really are. And to do it, all you have to do is just get a small table or a spot somewhere in the center of the house. Now, this was usually done in the hearth of the home. Um, our homes nowadays don't generally have hearths. So what you can do is just put it in the center of the house. And the center of the house doesn't need to be the actual physical center it can be where um, the main focus of the family is so it might be somewhere in your lounge it might be in the kitchen kitchen is often um, the, the, the heart of the home 
Um, so heart of the home, heart of the home. It's where the focus of the family just really becomes. So, so find a spot in that heart of the home. And you take a red candle and you can take a, a bowl. Um, they do like milk, um, they do like bread. Um, you can give them some honey if you want to. Porridge is a good, a good option. Um, just something simple that they can actually feed on. And then all you do is light the candle, put the bowl on the table, and just start talking to it. And eventually, you know, you, you just keep doing this, and eventually it will actually start communicating with you, or tell it, tell it, uh, tell you its name. Um, and then you can, you know, you, you have this protective house ghost. So that, that, that's just what I love doing. I, I love um, interacting with is, is the house ghost. Um, don't tell anybody else the name of your house ghost. Obviously, your family members are a different story, but uh, anybody living in the house, they well, obviously can know because they, they probably need to actually work with it and interact with it as well. But don't go bragging about, you know, you've got this house ghost name, blah, blah, blah. Um, it's a very private thing. It's a very personal thing. So, you know, just keep it that way. And you'll find that they, they will protect the house. Um, they'll keep away negative energies, negative entities. Um, you may even find to the point where if, if somebody wants to come and break in, that they, they just end up not doing it um, for some or other reason. Um, but they are, they're very good. The house ghost is very protective and very, very helpful. They help around the house, they protect the house. Um, just as long as, as I say, you, you keep the house nice and tidy and you don't disrespect the house ghost by disrespecting your home. Uh, really as simple as that. And uh, yeah, so those are the two methods that I find are excellent. Um, they work brilliantly and they're nice and easy and they're nice and simple. They're not too complicated um, and they are permanent. Um, if you just work with setting up energetic barriers that will keep things out or repel things, then um, you know those energy barriers do need to be replenished every now and then. Uh, with the ward, the ward is always there. The ward's there from probably before you were born. It may even continue with you th uh, through from life to life. Um, and the house ghost, treat it well, keep it fed, uh, keep it happy. It will always protect your home. And with the house ghost, uh, if you move from home to home, it will also follow you. I've, I've, that's what I found. Um, it does follow you from home to home. So it, it doesn't become fixed to the actual house or to the actual home. Well, if you consider the home is where the heart is, then if you move from house to house, it's going to follow you from home to home because that's where, where the home is. It's with you. It's with the family. Um, not with the house specifically. So it will follow you around uh, and move from place to place if you move house. So you don't have to go and set up um, a new, uh, well, well, call a, a new uh, house ghost every time you move house. Um, what you can do if you do move house is just do some kind of little ritual. Um, what's good is to, something I, I learned some years back, um, you actually you can take a candle, burn it for a while, ask the entity, the house ghost, to actually um, go into the candle. Or what you can do is take a take some kind of home, a stone, um, an object that represents it. For instance, um, you know if if you've got a little wooden house, uh, you can you find somewhere you can make them or or whatever. If you're creative and crafty enough. Um, you know, you can use that for instance. And all you do is ask the entity to go into that object. And then what you do is you take the object to the new house, you put it down in its new place, you burn the candle and you ask the house ghost to come back out again and introduce it to the new house. Um, so really it, it becomes part of the family. And it, uh, the, I just, the house ghost can be quite fun and especially for the kids um, and it's it's nice for the kids because it's a fairy um, 
It is a fairy, it's part of the fairy realm, it's part of the hidden folk, it's part of the, the fairy people. Um, so you can actually introduce your kids to this concept and, uh, and they, they can grow up getting to know this house ghost, uh, which is excellent for them. And anyway, that's it for today. And uh, I will see you next week. Have a brilliant weekend. Cheers.